Well, good evening to you. Take your hymnal, please, number 313, 313. Stand with me, please, as we sing, We're Marching to Zion, 313. in this beautiful night and God bless you for your faithfulness and I trust that as we always say here that your heart will be open because you don't want to waste this time you have these opportunities and someday you'll look back on them and you'll wish and uh, either you'll say thank God I did or would God I had and so pray and open your heart to the Lord tonight if you would you glad you say amen, amen. Andrew is going to open in prayer for us please Andy Amen. Be seated. As you're seated, number 142, the wonder of it all, 142.
visitors tonight. If we have any, I'd like to see where you're seated. So all we ask to raise your hand. Anyone here visiting with us tonight at Beacon Baptist Church? Hold your hands up there really high. Okay, welcome back to regular folks. And the Galatis, this I believe is their last Sunday. Is that right, Brother Frank? So we're going to miss them dearly. Very faithful family, godly folks. And so pray for them. They're heading up to some cold west, northwest country. And so we're praying for you, Galatis. God bless you. A few announcements. First of all, Hebrews chapter 2, if you want to mark that spot. Hebrews chapter 2, Christmas program. Sunday, December the 16th, it's 11 a.m. We want you to invite folks because they'll be hearing a simple, brief gospel message. Sometimes people will come to hear music during that season, and so that's the purpose of it. So I hope you'll do that part of the purpose, and also to bless our hearts. Choir and orchestra will meet in the Sunday School Hour in the auditorium on the 16th, so don't forget about that as well. There are invitation cards in the back. Just take some if you can pass those at work or wherever and invite people to come as well. Men, don't forget our prayer meeting is this Saturday, 8 a.m., in the regular spot, fellas. Also, Wednesday night, I'll be teaching, Lord willing, the gospel according to Paul, and I hope you'll be in your places for that. And then you'll notice in the table, there's in the back, there's a table with a lot of uh, material for this time of year. Hanukkah, if you have Jewish friends that you care about, you want to plant the seeds of the gospel, they're all free. There's um, Hanukkah cards and, and such, and so feel free to go back there and get whatever you think you need for your Jewish friends. The hymn is 230, Glory to His Name, 230. Let's stand together, shall we? Standing together, please. Two, three, zero. prayers we give thanks for our evening offering. Our Father, once again tonight, how grateful we are for all of your blessings to us. We thank you, Father, most of all for the privilege of being here tonight to hear from your word and to once again, Father, glorify your name. Even now, Father, as we give back to you a portion that you bless us with, take these gifts and offerings and use them for your glory and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you for that. Our scripture reading tonight is taken from Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 will be reading responsibly verses 1 through 6 of Hebrews chapter 2. Trust you'll turn your Bibles there as we read together. Hebrews chapter 2 beginning with verse 1 down through verse 6 responsibly. And shall we stand together for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But in one a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Our Father, again tonight, we commit this time to you afresh. Once again, Father, realizing our need to hear from you, realizing, Father, that all we have and all we need, can be met, the need can be met by you. Bless your words that goes forth, and we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Sam. I want you to look again, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 of this text. You'll notice the writer of Hebrews uses a very interesting imagery when applying a very, very critical New Testament truth for people of God. Verse 1 says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest, that's a warning, at any time we should let them slip. Now the word slip that the Bible uses here is again very interesting. It is connected to the word neglect in verse 3 when it says, how shall we escape if we neglect? And the reason it is connected is that both of these words in the Greek were part of the maritime vocabulary of the first century. The word slip literally meant to float, it meant to drift, and the word neglect was used to describe a derelict, exact same word, a derelict is an abandoned ship or an abandoned boat. It is a vessel that's in the water, it's left to drift and become waterlogged. And so again, the picture, the imagery that God is using here is one of drifting or, or floating away instead of giving what verse 1 calls, quote, the more earnest heed. This is a vessel that is allowing the most important and crucial things in life to float right past them as they drift dangerously and sometimes almost unknowingly with the currents of this world. You see, now follow this carefully. This is, this is important to understand how Hebrews was constructed. Hebrews chapter 1, just before our text, is a chapter that gives not one single command, not one single admonition for God's people. They're not, we're not told in that chapter to do, if you will, anything. Instead, Hebrews chapter 1 is a chapter of declaration and celebration for who God is and what God has done in the believer's life. And so it ends, it begins, you'll notice, with the word God. That's a, an amazing thing, God. And then it ends, chapter 1, with the word salvation. It is a chapter that describes the most amazing, glorious truths about God, about God's Son, and what happened when He came to this earth. It's a wonderful chapter. It's a glorious chapter, of course. And so it is that at the end of that declaration, at the end of that revelation, that is full of glory, the next chapter begins with the word therefore. You see that, right? Therefore, meaning that we're about to receive the very first command in the book of Hebrews and a command based upon all of these glorious truths that we just read about and heard. Verse, verse 1, chapter 2. Therefore, based upon all that glory, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. I remember a long time ago, I was 14 years of age, I had the opportunity to travel by bus, Red Lion Bus it was called, from Hope Mills, North Carolina to Monterey, Mexico for a missions trip. 
And it included days, several days, of driving along you know, through the mountains and then along the Gulf Coast, and obviously seeing a lot of things I'd never seen before, including on one occasion the sight of a whole bunch of boats off in the water in the Gulf Coast. There had been a hurricane or two not too long before that, and, and they were just dilapidated, abandoned, deserted, useless boats. My pastor, Pastor Fur, at the time who was leading this trip said, that those boats were derelicts. He used the word derelicts. They were at one time somebody's pride and joy for fishing or for for sport. And all of those boats, now derelicts, used to be well-maintained and profitable. But there they were, were without moorings, without captains. They were drifting, some of them. They were broken and they were dangerous. And, And they're not just in danger as boats, but they were a danger to others who were even around them. And so it is that with things that drift and things that float around in the spiritual world, their ship of state is not just in danger, but they themselves are becoming a danger to others around. And the reason, as this text sort of of pictures for us, is neglect. As a Christian, they're drifting. The word is sliding, floating instead of sailing or rowing or being anchored with the purposes of God. In fact, you'll notice in this text how it goes on from here, what God does tell to his own people and what we are to do. Look at just the beginning verses of all these chapters. Chapter 2, verse 1, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed. Chapter 3, verse 1, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left of us entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Chapter uh, 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. You see, the Bible, beloved, is not just a book to learn. This is a book to live. And God certainly didn't save us just to float around, go with the flow, until we're all beaten up with the rocks against some shore and then of no little use. No, you and I, tonight, have a great calling. In fact, the Bible, as chapter 3 says, it's a heavenly calling. It's a high, high, holy calling from God. And to fulfill that calling, we cannot afford to be a floater. We can't afford to be drifters as people of God. And some folks tonight, under the sound of my voice, while you're sitting in church on a Sunday night, spiritually, you are adrift. The question is this. How do you avoid the danger that's being spoken of? How do you keep from neglecting so great, so great salvation, as the writer calls it? As we said, this is absolutely critical for this life of faith that all of us as believers are a part of, how not to be a drifter. Here it is. And I'll use metaphors as well, but you'll see that the metaphor just has a biblical context in this book. Number one, keep your hands on the oars. Keep your hands on the oars, which is to say, stay focused on what it is God has called you to do and what it is you're doing. Never let go of what you know, of what you've heard. Go back to chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. In other words, look, there is such a thing as truth. Chapter 1 describes a lot of it. Read it tonight when you get home because it is glorious. But it is imperative that you and I stay focused upon the truth and the things of God, what it teaches. Chapter 3, verse 1 again. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, that's you if you're saved. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Later, he's going to say, looking unto Jesus, the author, and fit. Consider him. Look unto him. Be focused. Consider him in all the things that you've learned and are learning and continue to learn. Give the most earnest heed to what? To the things that we have heard. To the things that you know. 
to the things you've been taught. This, God says, must be your focus. That's keeping, if you will, your hands on the oars. 1 Corinthians 14.10 says this, There are so many kinds of voices in the world. True, right? I mean, there are all kinds of voices, and I mean voices in languages, and also in philosophy and faith. There are so many voices. And you know, all of those voices are clamoring for your heart, young people, for your minds. All these voices you are being bombarded with day and night, every day of the week. And people want your, your ear. Rush Limbaugh wants you to hear what he has to say. Morning Joe wants you to hear what he has to say. Hollywood wants you to listen to them. Mark Zuckerberg wants you to listen to him. Jeff Bezos wants you to listen to him. In fact, lately these days, Joe Biden wants us all to listen to him. Paula White, former President Obama, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, NBC, ABC, CNN, Fox, the Pope, the Dalai Lama, Pat Robertson, Tom Cruise, Glenn Beck, Donald Trump, Chuck Schumer. Have you noticed if there's a TV, a camera anywhere in New York City, Chuck Schumer wants you to listen. He has things he thinks that you need to hear and that I need to hear. They want us to hear whatever it is they have to say. So do the New York Times and the Palm Beach Post and the Washington Post and Meet the Press and Today's Show and Dr. Phil and the Situation Room with Wolf Blitzer. NPR wants you in the morning. PBS wants you at noon. Chris Matthew wants you at night. Nightline wants you even later at night. In fact, Phil Swift wants me two in the morning to learn about his flex tape over and over and over again. You should be Billy Mays here. <laughs> Billy Mays and his mighty putty. Everybody wants your ear. Everybody wants to have your heart. Not to mention, by the way, your boss, the baby, the bill collectors, the business, the bail bondsman for Brother Remo and others. <laughs> you see, is it no wonder that verse 1 says to give the more, the more earnest heed because you're going to need to give more. Everybody wants your heart. Everybody wants your focus. It's easy to get caught with the current. So keep your hands, if you will, on the oars of truth. Keep your focus where, beloved, it belongs. It's easy to be distracted. I mean, just in practical means, yes. But in spiritual world, especially, it's easy to be distracted. The other day, I went to a, a TJ Maxx and there was a, a, a shirt. I wasn't paying attention. It was 70% off clearance and it was my size. So I got it. I wasn't focused. Nor was I focused when I got home later and the next day or so, I, I opened up the package and I started to iron it. And as I ironed it, I noticed it had French cuffs. I don't wear French cuffs. I don't even have cuff links. To me, French cuffs are redundant. You're gonna put buttons on a button. I mean, you're gonna buy a shirt and then they're gonna make you go out and buy buttons for that shirt. And sure enough, that's what I had to do. What a scam, amen? <laughs> Why are they French cuffs? I think because when they surrender, you can see the cuffs, amen? That's what it says. <laughs> So I couldn't take it back because I'm not like some of you ladies. <laughs> Crystal. <laughs> so I had to go out yesterday and get cufflinks, all because I wasn't focused. And so this is the first time in 40 years I've worn, although I do feel like Donald Trump a little bit. Right? So. <laughs> so many distractions. I was picking that shirt up and answering a text at the same time. Now in the spiritual world, everybody wants your attention and your ear. And there's a radio, and there's a television, and there's the internet. There are a million ways that they can get your attention. Are you staying focused? Keep your hands on the oars, he says, of the things that we have heard and the things that we have learned. Number two, Number one is stay focused. Number two, stay forward. That is, keep the oars in the water. Keep your hands on the oars. Number two, keep the oars in the water. Can I remind you of this? One of the purposes for oars is to steer the boat. Look at our text again and go to chapter four, would you? Verse one. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, 
any of you should seem to come short of that rest, short of his rest. You see, the problem with drifting in the Christian life isn't just that you're not going anywhere. It's actually worse. The problem is that drifters are going backwards. There used to be a word they used in church all the time called backsliding. It's a Bible word. Somebody's backslidden. It's just like dead wood or dead fish. They go downstream, they go with the current. Instead of rowing or swimming upstream and therefore forward, in this case, in the will of God. And beloved, I gotta tell you, what has always struck me about Hebrews chapter two, Hebrews chapter three is the very serious tone, the very sober warnings that are contained in that text. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? How shall we escape? Pastor, escape what? Quite frankly, escape shipwreck. Escape the dangers of destruction that comes with those who drift. Escape foolishness for saved people. Drifting leads to brokenness and barrenness and, and rebellious children and hurt marriages and debt and bondage and a bitter spirit that wrecks your heart and your health following you all the way to the grave. For lost people, drifting leads to exactly what the text warns of, eternal separation from God and hell. And by the way, that's why God in his mercy comes along and gives to people little wake-up calls. Maybe he's giving somebody here one tonight. But God in his grace comes along and he, he gives little nudges and wake-up calls because he loves his children, spiritual tension getters to those who are carelessly floating away towards danger and destruction. There's a very famous story about an Easterner who was visiting the western wilderness in the 18th century. Some of you have read the story, I know. He wanted to go canoeing along a beautiful stretch of mountains, valleys, and rivers. And so some local trappers came, they loaded him in their canoe, and they warned him, just don't get apathetic and let the river take him downstream too fast. At first, the man took the warning fairly seriously, but before too long, he was starting to weary of the constant fighting against the stream and the rowing, even though it was just steady and slow. He knew he'd gone upstream quite a bit, so he felt safe and decided to inload the paddles and enjoy the amazing scenery for a while, and, and who wouldn't? He laid back. He dangled his hands in the cool water. He decided to rest his eyes. The sun smiled on his brow and a gentle breeze ruffled his hair and in just minutes he fell asleep. And sometime later he was awakened by the sounds of screaming and yelling and what sounded like thunder but it wasn't thunder it was the roar of water plunging over the falls and the screaming was that of men on the banks trying to get him to wake up. Finally he did sit up and he awoke and he was panicked and he grabbed the oars and he rowed with all of his might but to no avail, the current was too strong, and the waters were too fast, and he did not escape with his life. Let me ask you a question. Do you realize that as a Christian, you are in a current that is always contrary to God's will and what is best for you and your family? Do we realize that? Do we realize that we in this world are in waters that, that go against the flow of spiritual things. The Christian life is not lived in a placid lake. It is lived in a river that flows away from the truth. And the current of this society and the current of our flesh and the current of daily life, in fact, the current of time itself is always trying to pull you downstream and away from the best things, the eternal things, the good things of God. Things tonight that you and I will never merely drift towards. So keep your oars in the water. Keep your hands on the oars. Which brings us to a third point in the last one. We see number one, keep your hands on the oars, that's focus. Number two, keep the oars in the water, that's stay forward. Number three, keep the water behind the oars. As boaters like to say, that means stay faithful. What do you mean, Pastor? Look at chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. 
Let us go on unto perfection, completion, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works of faith toward God. Now, wait a minute. When we say keep the waters behind the oars, I'm talking about moving. I'm talking about actually rowing, leaving the principles, the basics of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul said, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you. When you ought to be eating the milk, uh, eating the meat, you're still drinking the milk. Put it this way. If you keep your hands on the oars, and the oars are in the water, but that's all, well, you're still drifting. It looks good. I mean, you've got your hands in place. You might even be looking and facing forward. And you look great. You got your Bible, you got your suit, you got your cufflinks. <laughs> looks great. But you're still losing ground. In a sense, a poser. Chapter 6, look at verse 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence under the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You know what? I can look around this place tonight and I see people that are not slothful. Not lazy in their faith. That's what he's saying. Look at those who are not like that. And you be among those. Let them be your example. And he's saying here, keep on. Keep on rowing. Rowing's no fun. I mean, it's fun at first and for a little while. We used to have these men's fellowships, father-son things, way back, I mean, when I first came here. And we would canoe up the Loxahatchee. Start out here at the farms. Any of you guys do that? I think, Steve, you might have done that. We'd start in the farms, and we would canoe for miles up the Trapper Nelsons. And then there was Camp Tanakita, I think it was called. I called it Tanaskitos, amen? <laughs> See, Pastor, was it fun? I don't know. 97 degree heat, carrying the canoe on your shoulders half the time, capsizing in gator infested waters, roaming through webs with spiders the size of Volkswagens. It was a blast. I remember Rick and Andy, they were little, they were really little. And they had oars, but they also had broomsticks for arms. <laughs> so who did all the rowing for four and a half, five hours? So it's just, uh, somewhere along the way, my arms fell off. And I remember thinking, what in the world am I doing here? Seminoles don't even row in canoes anymore, amen? <laughs> God wanted us to paddle. He wouldn't have given us outboard motors. Amen, Brother Aubrey, amen. <laughs> no, rowing, I mean, the whole picture of it's not fun. Drifting is fun. I mean, drifting is great. You just lay back, hang loose, go with the flow, chill, close your eyes, and akuna matata. <laughs> Drifting requires no effort at all. It's relaxing. And I have to tell you, it's pretty much why mega churches have mega crowds. You've got 10,000 drifters who float in for a cool drink, a little, little sightseeing, and there's no mention of sober or somber warnings or serious tones about no escaping if neglect. None of that. Drifting is easy on the ears. It's really easy on the arms. And really, that's why we have millions of drifters who are not making much headway for a nation that's going backwards spiritually. But you see, folks, it's okay that rowing takes effort. It's okay that we're supposed to take the more earnest heed and be proactive. It's okay because we have a high calling. We have a heavenly calling. And guess what? The, you talk about work and labor, it goes on to describe what Jesus did for us. 
and the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, admonishes us to, still to this very night. Don't drift, don't float, don't wander, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Run with patience the race that is set before you. I lay down on an inner tube in Satellite Beach when I was in the sixth grade. And I remember just laying back and, and the sea was glassy. It was awesome. And I fell asleep. And I woke up, I don't know how many miles north I was, somewhere near Cape Canaveral. I just remember looking and I could barely see the shore and I was terrified. And you know, that's what happened. It was slow, it was unnoticeable, and it took a lot of work, way more work than I needed to do for me to get back to safety. I remember reading years ago something I came across, Clarence Darrow wrote, by God's grace that I cannot identify with. Clarence Darrow, you may remember, was the American lawyer who unsuccessfully defended John Scopes in the famous Scopes trial. People always think that Darrow won. He actually lost that trial, that verdict. He debated William Jennings Bryan. He's a hero of Hollywood, a hero of the left, because he was such an agnostic. And he said these words, quote, The best that we can do is be helpful toward our fellow passengers who are clinging to the same speck of dirt while we are drifting side by side to our common doom. Thank you, Mr. Sunshine. Now, these are the words of the Apostle Paul and the truth. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not, I'm not clinging to a speck of dirt drifting to our common doom. We're sailing to glory, and glory is the home of our soul. And our Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. He is worthy of whatever effort, whatever sacrifice, Whatever toil, whatever faith, whatever labor, whatever focus this journey requires of all of us here. So I'm preaching to myself, and I'm imploring the people that I love. If you're drifting, stop. If you're just going with the current, stop. It's a warning. Lest. Get your hands back on the oars. Get a hold of these glorious truths. Don't let them slip. Get your hands on the oars, get the oars in the water, and get the water behind the oars. And do what it takes to keep going forward and toward the glory and the blessing and the will of God. And God's people said, Amen. let's bow our heads, shall we, for just a moment. I wonder who would say tonight, Pastor Blalock, I'm a believer tonight by the grace and the mercy of God. I put my faith in Christ. And those glorious truths in Hebrews chapter 1, I know them well. I've experienced them. They're part of my spirit and my soul. But as a believer, I needed this message. As a believer, I need to be reminded of how easy it is in this strong current. Just like the when the Hebrew writer was writing, it was a strong current then, the Roman Empire for Paul and others. But Pastor, I needed this reminder, I needed this message in the Holy Spirit speaking to me about something. I don't know what it is, but, and I won't see your hands, of course, not everybody, but as a testimony to the Lord with heads bowed, eyes closed, you say, that's me, Pastor, would you pray for me? Anyone like that? Raise your hand, and God sees your heart, yes. Maybe you're here tonight, and you're not even sure you're in a boat that God owns and controls. You're not even sure that you're truly a child of God. And I would say to you tonight, as the same book that we just read from tonight says, today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts. And you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. We had several raise their hands this morning and say, I'm not saved. Would you pray for me to be saved? Well, maybe you're here tonight. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm not sure, but I want to be sure. Would you pray? Who would say that? Would you lift your hand up? I would love to pray for you. I won't embarrass you, but I'd love to pray for you. All right, God bless you. I want to pray and saying, I surrender all. Sing it in your heart tonight, won't you? Think about the words. And maybe just refocus. Refocus your mind and your heart. 
so that instead of drifting, we, as the Bible says, are laboring to enter into his rest. We're being faithful. We're going forward, not backwards. Father, we ask that you'll bless the invitation, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the warnings of your word. And there are empty seats all through this room of people that we love who are no longer here, whose lives are shipwreck, and who started out drifting some time ago. I pray, Father, that, that all of us who are in this room tonight will heed your encouraging, your admonition, and your warning in these texts and others. Lord, help us not to drift. Help us to run our race with patience, knowing it's a long, long race, and that we're to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of it, just as the Lord Jesus did, who the, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And bless these who have asked for prayer, please, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand together, shall we? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I surrender all. You know the hymn. And again, here's the altar as we sing. If God is speaking to your voice, or speaking to your heart, obey his voice, won't you? Jerry. Father, thank you for your church. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And this season, Father, when so many family members got to be with one another and, and the joy of that, Lord, we are grateful. Grateful for your goodness. Grateful for your strength and this so great salvation. We are so grateful, Father. Help us, help us, please. Not to neglect, not to drift. That there be no derelicts among your people. Help us to be useful and going forward in a testimony of your grace and your glory. We'll praise you for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And amen. Glad you're saved. Amen. Fellowship, you're dismissed.